In this video, I'm going to prove with hard data and facts that the scout dynamic tool compensation is not always perfect. I know it's weird to hear this from its designer. Everything on an aircraft must have a reason. Ignore the status quo, imagine from scratch, and build what you can justify with science. Fail five times to succeed once. This is how we innovate paramotors. And for you, understanding the science behind will make you a smarter pilot. This is number three of our torque experiment videos. In the first one, we measured torque on a giant swing under the bridge and it ended up with a big crash, surprisingly. I'm sure that video is fun to watch. Uh, in the second, I tried to measure torque in the air and it didn't really lead to desired results, but we learned from that a lot. Now, this time, I'm not going to measure torque in Newton meters, the actual number, but I want to compare and measure how much of that torque is getting compensated in percent? If torque compensation is kind of a new term for you, I would recommend to check out our Paramotor Geometry Classroom video series, especially chapters 11 to 16, where all the physics behind is perfectly explained, and that will help you to understand this video. In this experiment, I'm hoping to give answer to three questions. First, how bad would it be to fly without any torque compensation at all? Secondly, does the scout dynamic torque compensation work perfect as claimed? And thirdly, how does the scout dynamic torque compensation compare to regular carabiner offset? No guesses, no feelings, no sales pitch, just hard data and facts. The method of this experiment is very, very simple. I'm going to fly straight, pick a point on the horizon exactly 90 degrees to my right, and then I will simply go off the brakes and let the torque turn me, and I will simply start the stopwatch. How many seconds does it take to turn 90 degrees? Simple as that. We will repeat this experiment 36 times. We will do it with three different paramotors times three different gliders times four different scenarios. The three parameters will be one with no torque compensation at all, second will be a standard scout with dynamic torque compensation, and the third will be a parameter with standard carabiner offset. Well, I will do it with three different gliders, that is uh, Axis Pluto size 226, which is a paragliding beginner intermediate wing. And then I want to do it uh, with the uh, Ozon Roadster, which is a beginner intermediate reflex paramotor glider. And then I will do it with my personal wing, which is Ozon Viper 5 size 20, which is a top level advanced glider. And we will do the experiment in four different scenarios, that is level flight, in at trim speed, which is the most important one, accelerated level flight, full power climb out at neutral trim, and off power glide down how it behaves. Let's go. I have to say this was the most exhausting and time consuming experiment and video we did so far. We had to do some modifications on the scouts special for this experiment. It took us several days to record those 36 uh, measurements and it was so crazy cold out there. Uh, I had my chase cam set wrongly, but I'm not going to repeat those measurements again, only because I screwed up with the video. The data is there, so let's go and analyze it. How bad would it be to fly a paramotor without any torque compensation at all? To answer this question, we had to specially modify the scout. Simply, we removed the dynamic torque compensation fins from the scout. That means we got perfectly symmetric carabiners, no torque compensation at all. The first flight I did was with Axis Pluto 3, size 26, which is a beginner slash intermediate paragliding wing. Now, the paramotor wing is meant for paragliding, but many pilots fly that. And it, it wasn't that bad, actually. So it did, at level flight, 100 degree turn in a minute. At fully accelerated, it was just a little bit more, 129. But in fact, the speed bar doesn't really do much on this glider. I mean, the RPM difference was 200 for level flight. At full power climb, it was already more significant. So it did like 245 degree turn. Now, things got a lot more dramatic when I took the Ozon Viper 5, which is an advanced glider. It did a half turn on level flight in one minute and both accelerated 
and full power climb it did pretty much the whole turn so obviously if you fly an advanced glider the torque matters a lot more why is that first of all fully accelerated i was flying at a lot higher rpm than accelerated pluto because the pluto doesn't really have a wide speed range secondly advanced gliders are a lot more reactive to the torque they are made to be playful the pluto is made for thermaling which is you normally do wide big radius turns you don't really seeking a steep bank angle so conclusion the more advanced glider you fly the more the torque matters to you how bad was it i mean it's flyable but you wouldn't want that now now that was bad <laughs> it was bad especially with the bicycle glider question number two does the scout dynamic torque compensation work perfect as claimed let's see the numbers it pretty much does in most cases at level flight with all the gliders it was it was flying perfectly straight the torque compensation was 100 percent the same for accelerated level flight with the viper 5 the torque compensation was 87 percent so pretty close now there were cases where the torque composition was not perfect it was only 50 percent on full power climb with the axis pluto 3 actually i was surprised the turn was quite relevant it got better when i was flying the roadster and the viper and that is my experience even from uh previous time and flying different gliders the scout dynamic torque composition works better the more advanced and faster glider you fly how does it look in real at full power the viper was doing a full turn and with dynamic torque compensation it was only doing one third of a turn so 66 percent compensation now how bad is it or how good it's actually pretty good this turn you can compensate with with a little bit of left way shift i mean you move your body a centimeter to the left in in the harness and you're done you're, you're good question number three how does the carabiner offset compare to the scout dynamic torque compensation to answer this question we did some special modification to the scout basically we kind of improvised the carabiner offset with some bolts and of course we removed the dynamic torque compensation in the back in the cage again i repeat the same experiments and i was actually surprised it worked pretty well it did fly straight on a level flight what I did not expect it though, that it will still fly straight on accelerated flight. Uh, I mean, no wonder uh, with Axis Pluto 3, because the difference between train speed and fully accelerated is kind of negligible, 200 RPM. But on the Ozone awesome Roadster 3, that's a mystery for me, because that glider already has a pretty decent speed range. All the theory says it should be turning to the right at fully accelerated, and it wasn't. I don't know. Honestly, I don't have an explanation for this. So you guys, uh, what's your experience? I mean, if you fly your glider fully accelerated, uh, on, the, on the carabiner or offset paramotor, does it turn to the side or, or, or is it straight? Maybe it's only something with the roster 3 that Ozone did some magic with the glider or some special trimming. When you push the speed bar and release the trimmers, it's kind of engages a little bit of tip steering on the, on the left. Or I don't know. I don't have an explanation for this. It's, it's contrary to all physics and theories. Now, with the Ozone Viper 5 on accelerated flight, it did turn to the right. And the right turning tendency was substantial at full power. Let's have a look. With the red line, you see 360 turn without any torque compensation. Now, the blue line is with a full power climb. The carabiner offset succeeded to take away probably one third, 35% uh, of the torque. And the green arrow is the dynamic torque compensation. Yes. It, it, it was noticeable so if you fly full power especially with advanced gliders you notice the torque for sure accelerated flight was not that bad it did almost a full turn with no torque compensation but the carabiner offset at full speed did a pretty decent job as you can see the blue arrow it's not as good as the green arrow but it's still a pretty pretty decent job i was surprised it's it's a, it, it's, it's, a, it's a good system bonus question how does it glide off power? Now, I have to admit, I never did this experiment before. Although many people have asked me, how does it feel when you glide off power? It's not a very common scenario in paramotor flying. 
let's have a look. So the red arrow obviously is the no torque compensation at all. So off power, no torque, no compensation, fine, perfectly straight, simple. The green arrow is scout torque compensation and it was turning to the left. It was. A little bit, not too much. I mean, you can overcompensate that with a little bit of weight shift, but but it was so obviously the airflow through the fins in the cage. It basically is turning the thing to the left, and I did a measurement with carabiner offset as well. That's the blue arrow, and it, that turned like two thirds of a circle in a minute of power. The day wasn't wasted. I learned something new. Conclusions: Carabiner offset is a good system. It's simple it's cheap and it's effective and it does a really good job in most scenarios scout dynamic tool compensation works 100 percent perfect in most scenarios and in those scenarios where it's not perfect it's still twice as good as the carabiner offset the more advanced glider you fly the better the dtc works and actually the worse the carabiner offset gets the more advanced pilot you are the more the difference matters to you because you're more likely to fly fully accelerated you are more likely to do sharp full power turns and you are more likely eventually do some acro maneuvers of power and those are the scenarios where the scout dtc works significantly better than the carabiner offset here i'm providing all the data and all the measurements so if you want to compare or you're curious how your setup your combination of paramotor and your glider works then maybe you can compare it with these numbers and feel free to leave a comment i'm gonna read those comments because i'm curious uh how, how it works and now let's go to the fun facts Fun fact number one, Roadster 3 size 26 was actually slightly overcompensated by the Scout DTC when flying fully accelerated. It was actually turning a little bit to the left. Nothing that would bother you, but it was interesting because I really didn't expect that. Fun fact number two, I needed less RPM to maintain level flight with a Viper 5 size 20 than with a Roadster size 26. How is that? Viper flies so much faster and yet I needed less RPM. Respect to Ozone, what they did with the Viper 5 is amazing. I love that glider. Fun fact number three, Roadster 2 size 24 turns less than Roadster 3 size 26. I did this experiment first time with a, with, a, with a Roadster 224 of previous generation. Now we needed to repeat those uh, experiments again because I screwed up. Then I took a new glider and surprisingly, the new generation, despite being a two meters larger, was more agile, Had it was just turning better. Again, respect to, to guys at Ozone, what they did we see direct improvement in handling uh, of those of those gliders fun fact number four dudek warp size 20 flew perfectly straight in all scenarios even in those scenarios where the viper 5 had a little bit of some some leftovers of uncompensated torque that was my previous glider that i did experiments uh, some while ago uh, i sold it already and this is actually a reason why i kind of feel a little bit of nostalgia for this glider it's an awesome glider i like the viper 5 feeling a little bit better than the dudek warp but the torque compensation worked better on the dudek warp in that aspect it was a better better combination with the scout one last comment I want to say hi to the guys from Skybean who made the chase cam. I've mentioned in the video that I screw up, screwed up the footage of the chase cam because a line got tangled in the chase cam and the whole camera was kind of sideways. Now I use the very first prototype of the chase cam developed by Skybean here in Slovakia. It's a small company led by Martin and his team. Ciao guys. and. I have huge respect for this for this little team because they were the first one to build the chase cam and they actually put extensive research and development in the process. They even built their own wing tunnel, a small one, 
kind of improvised and not really fancy, but they built a wind tunnel to design the chase game. Now, it won't happen again. I will not get the lines tangled again because now I, now I'm, now I have a new chase cam, a new model from from uh, from Skybeam, which is a genius design. It's kind of stupid proof, so I won't screw up again. But what I'm wanting to say is, I have huge respect to everybody in this sport who is doing R and D, who is doing, who is implementing innovation to to our sport and and pushing this sport forward so you guys if you are in a market for a chase cam and the price difference doesn't matter to you that much then you know what get get the one from skybeam reward them for all the effort they they do in innovation and development that's my final message respect for innovation in this board thank you very much for watching see you next time we have some cool videos on the list